over the years have heard sermons on Psalm 33 quite a few times. Um, and generally, uh, they follow three topics. So the first one is, it's a great song of praise. And I'll certainly be talking about that. Secondly, it's to express or stress the importance of good worship. And we'll have a look at that as well. And then finally, it's about the importance of the church and Christians being involved in politics. Uh, and if you're Amer American, you'll probably find that on Independence Day, quite a few preachers will use Psalm 33 to berate uh, Christian politicians uh, or Christians who aren't involved in politics to do more. Um, and I've heard one or two good sermons on that uh, over the years. Um, but before uh, I say any more, I, I have a I really want to um, pay credit to the Holman Old Testament, uh, Old Testament commentary, which I actually used for quite a bit of my outline for the first part of my sermon. So if you want to read more about uh, what I'm saying in the first uh, third, if you've got a copy of the Holman Old Testament commentary, look up Psalm 33, you'll find quite a bit of it reasonably familiar, though hopefully I will have added one or two bits to it. So, it's a great song of praise. And if you read it carefully, you can see many aspects of the character of our Lord. So I came up with a list of t my top 20. Uh, it's not exhaustive. You can find some more because I deliberately left a few out. Um, so please go have a look for yourself. Um, but number one would be, it is fitting for the upright to praise him. Number two, the word of the Lord is right and true. Number three, he is, he is faithful in all he does. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. He made the heavens. They were created by his breath. He is capable of constraining the power of the seas. The earth, that's all of us, should fear him. He can overthrow any nation, country, or kingdom. He plans. His plans cannot and will not be overthrown. He doesn't change, not from one generation to another. He blesses nations who follow him. From heaven, he sees, sees everything. Nothing is hidden. He understands us intimately. He gives us hope. He is our shield. His name is holy. And finally, and certainly not the least, his love is unfailing. So I challenge you to reread the psalm and see what else you can find. There are some more in there. Go do your homework. Without a shadow of a doubt, it is fitting for the upright to praise him. The late and great uh, bishop, in fact, I think he was an archbishop, William Temple, is well known for the following quip. When I pray, coincidence, coincidences happen. And when I don't, they don't. But on worship, he wrote, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the will to the purposes of God. Now this is a wonderful definition of worship because it goes beyond, well beyond what I would say our functional worship, uh, view of worship is, which is normally a couple of hymns and choruses, some prayer, 
the offering, a message of some type, and then the benediction. That's normally what we do on a Sunday. In some churches, the order will be slightly different, though normally the benediction does come at the end and the welcome's at the beginning, but bits might vary in between. Our very functional view of worship really doesn't meet, I think, what God calls us to do. So do you have worship? Or does God, through worship of him, have you? Notice the actions, action words in Temple's definition. Quicken, feed, purge, open, and devote. All these words are, all these words being actions, basically it should be noted that uh, they go in both directions. From God and from God to us. Oh, sorry, from us to God and from God to us. For as we open our worship to God, he also opens to us. Returning to the beginning of the psalm, David writes for us to rejoice, to sing joyfully because of what God has done. So we are called to rejoice. His encouragement is sing joyfully. With praise in verse 1, we are called to praise him for who he is. So in today's hustle, we should forget what is going on around us and focus on him. This is why this first verse is so critical. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. When you focus on him, life's focus changes from your wants to what he wants. David understood this, and this gives us great insights here about what our priority should be. Now, he tells us to praise him with the harp and lyre. Certainly music often helps us with worship. Um, we've certainly sung a cappella here a few times before when we've been short of musicians, and it's been great, but it's hard work, isn't it? It's much better when we have the musicians. Music is very powerful, and it certainly can be used to help change the mood. The mood. And you'll see that on your TVs. You'll see it in the movies. Certainly, uh, all the great mu movies have great musical scores, and that's to catch your spirit, to catch your emotion, even more so when we're here in church. He knew that to set music would help us focus intently on God. He also said that we should sing new songs. Well, I think that's also to help us think more about God and what he does for us. It's not that the old songs are bad, though to be fair, some are dreadful. But there are lots of good old ones. And there are lots of good ones, well, maybe they're old. I mean, uh, most of the songs I remember well are from the 80s and 90s. If we asked the kids, they would tell me they're old, wouldn't they? Um, but we will have songs of our generation. And then there's the new ones that people have written. And these are all there so that we can learn more of God and so that we can focus on them. But if you're older, like me, or even older, don't reject the new ones. These are just people's new musings on what God has set on his heart and should be setting on your hearts. I think there's another thing about worship. We are instructed to play skillfully and shout for joy. This is a direction on how we should worship. Worship is not meant to be a secret. Now, I know to keep some of the uh, locals happy, we close the windows uh, when we sing. Um, I think, in all honesty, we should probably open them up and let them hear our praises. I know they'd complain, well, maybe we should just practice a bit more and sing more skillfully, and then they would have less to complain about. 
You can certainly worship in private, but we definitely should be worshiping in public. It should be a witness that testifies to what God has done and what he is doing in our lives. But why should we rejoice? Well, first of all, God's word is all powerful. You'd see in verse 4 that he's been intimately involved in the entirety of uh, humanity's history. What God does is correct, right, and true, including all of his word. Therefore, when he directs us in certain paths, it's a reliable instruction that he's giving us. God doesn't change his plans. He's already made them. He's already given us his instructions. They're all written in his scripture. He certainly will inspire people through the Holy Spirit, but you can test anything his Holy Spirit has instructed you against his scripture. He's certainly commanded what happens in each of our nations. He directed the heavens to be made. And we were told that he put the stars in its place with his breath. He limits the boundaries of the seas. And even the depths are known to him. All creation was created by his command. And from this, we certainly should rejoice. God's will is all ruling. He overrules man's plans. Our demands do not sway him unless we're seeking to follow his will. If you want to make God laugh, tell him what your plans are. He's certainly supportive of what we do, but he has his plans and better we fall in line with them. God's eyes are all seeing. He watches all things. You can read that in verses 12 to 14. And everything we do, he has dominion over. He weighs all things. You can see that in verses 15 through 17. And he considers and measures what we do. We are answerable for what we do in this life. And he witnesses all believers You can see that in verses 18 to 19. But be clear, he misses nothing, the good and the bad. So, why does this matter? Well, it's quite simple. If God sees everything, better we dedicate our lives to doing what he wishes us to do. God leads us to rejoicing. It's amazing when we consider how God has already given us a roadmap. In verse 20, we can wait on God. We are meant to be committed to the Lord. Verse 20 indicates this. His people were patient to respond to him as he called them to move. And in Exodus, you can see that they were obedient. They moved when he told them. And it wasn't easy in any shape or form. Second, we should trust in God. And you can see that in verse 21. They worshipped and trusted in him because of what he had done for them before. The Hebrew word for trust is batach, which means to attach oneself or to depend upon. These people batached themselves to the one who had provided for them in all things. And third, the hope in God, which you can read in verse 22. May your unfailing love be with us. They pleaded with God to stay with them. Why? As we put our hope in you, God is all they would ever need. Their confession is, he is their everything. They are totally dependent. It is a people like this God is seeking. Ones who obey and serve him with love. 
God is calling to us today to understand this, to believe and to follow. Even in the topic of praise, he directs us to wait, trust, and hope in him. So each day we are given a chance to praise him, to honour all he will do. And each night we can reflect back on what he has done, giving honour for it. Charles Spurgeon once said, Beloved friends, may we well continue to praise God, for our God continues to give us causes for praise. So, are you upright? Are you one of his people? Have you repented, been born again, and now live in Christ? According to Jesus, we are adopted into his kingdom. Those of us who have chosen to pick up our crosses and follow him are members of his people. So assuming you are a Christian, then you should worship him, for it is fitting for us to praise him. Which brings us to the second aspect, that good worship is important. So what does... Psalm 33 say about worship. Um, I'm only going to look at six verses. Yeah, that's six. Uh, So verses one through three, and then the last three in the psalm. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. And then the last three verses. We will wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. First, our worship should be joyful. So as I said before, we should ban the dirges and any discordant hymns. Um, that, I suspect, means quite a few hymns in our own hymn, old hymnary need to go, and maybe one or two of the modern ones as well. But our hymns should be joyful. Secondly, we should play instruments and sing. Now, as you will know, I come from Scotland, and for a long period in Scottish church history, we banned all instruments. And one or two churches in Scotland still don't allow instruments. They're actually quite good at singing. But boy, would their worship improve with one or two instruments. I think David had it right. God gave us uh, music and instruments for a reason. It touches our soul. It stirs our emotion. We should use instruments. And thank God we have people like you who can. And if you're sitting out there and you play an instrument and you haven't told us, shame on you. You should also be playing. And if you're not that good at it, you can practice. God has given you a gift. Use it. Anyway, enough of me berating people. Thirdly, we should play or sing and do it skillfully. And that, of course, means that we should practice That also means that you shouldn't let your mind wander. I know that there might be a visitor to your left or your right and you're wondering where they come from. It doesn't matter. Let them enjoy the worship with us and you join in the worship as well. You can speak to them after and then you'll discover all about them. Don't worry about the cooking on the stove. It will either be fine or it will be burnt. Nothing you can do will change that because you're here. Concentrate on the worship. Concentrate on the Lord. Let your songs and spirit flow. Fourthly, we should even shout to him in joy. So no turning the music down. No closing the windies, as they would say in Glasgow. Well, not unless the song asks us to be quiet and gentle. And then I think it's okay. Fifthly, our worship should be full of hope because that is what our faith is all about. Sixthly, in our worship, our hearts should rejoice. If they're not, then something is wrong. 
talk to one of the elders about it. Seventh, our praises should reflect his holy name. As you'll know, I didn't put the burden on the worship leader and the musicians, though certainly they have their duties in worship. The burden is on all of us. It is our duty to sing with joy and to make a wonderful noise to his name. So for sure, if you have gifts of music, use them. And for those of us who are less gifted and simply fill the pews and sing along, during the week, you could practice some of the hymns. Now, I know I look like a complete muppet when I'm driving singing hymns going down the road, but frankly, I'm probably not going to meet most of the people who drive past me. Again, it doesn't matter. I certainly turn up at work with a smile on my face, although there's probably a few hundred people that think there was a nutter going down the motorway, but never mind. So practice. Be nuts if you have to be. Let the kids complain, because I also sing when my kids are in the car. And I sing in the shower. Uh, oh, never mind. God gave you a voice. Use it. Especially if you've got a good voice. And if it's a bit ropey like mine, practice more. Don't hide or restrict your gifts. Now I know some of you are very good singers. Maybe it's about time we reconsidered having a choir. Even if just occasionally. In all our worship, we should be putting our best forwards. We should be filling this church with hope and joy. So worship leaders, kick those awful hymns. Shout out with joy, the golden oldies, the slightly newer ones, and feel free to experiment with new hymns. Maybe not too many in one hit, but I learned a new majesty today. Thank you. I liked it. Just fill this place with hope and joy. And when we've mastered this, then we should really open these windows and sing out. Now, as we all know from Corinthians 13, the greatest gifts are faith, hope, and love. And of course, the greatest being love. So if we really want to offer God true worship, we need to make sure first and last that our praises are also filled with love. And finally, the importance of the church and Christians being involved in politics. I don't care what your politics are. I assume they're reasonably sane and they're heartfelt and you've thought them through, but I really don't care if you're from the left or the right or maybe somewhere in between. And I'm certainly not going to tell you what my politics are. Don't worry. And in this fellowship, we also ask people to leave their denominations at the front door and that people should keep the main thing the main thing. And what is the main thing? Well, according to Reagan Wilson, our previous uh, pastor, it meant maintaining unity in the love of Christ. If you want to understand what this love is, of course, you can look to Christ or indeed the fruits of the Spirit, which are, of course, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we certainly should have an expectation that the people around us in this sanctuary are filled with these fruits. So is it not unreasonable that we who are called to treat our neighbors as we would wish to be treated ourselves should exemplify these fruits outside those doors? Does that not also mean that we should have similar expectations of the people we vote for? Now, I know if you support a specific political party, you might not have a suitable candidate at the moment with those gifts. But assuming you are a Christian, you have those gifts. So maybe it's time for you to consider standing for public office. Because none of, if none of the rest of the crowd have these beliefs and gifts, it's about time we had people that did. 
Wouldn't all countries be much better places if genuine Christians filled the ranks of their parliaments? I don't mean people who claim they're Christians, but men and women who exemplify love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you love your country, and you should, you should then consider how best you may serve your country and your neighbors in prayer, in service, and when you cast your votes. So to summarize the theme of Psalm 33, if you may, I will turn to John Stott. The balanced Christian who takes scripture for his guide will seek to live equally and simultaneously in Christ and in the world. He cannot opt out of either as his truth lives both not of this world and yet of this world. This is the life of discipleship to which Jesus Christ calls us. He died and rose again that we might have newness of life. He has given his Holy Spirit so we can live out this life in this world, the world that his Father created. Now he calls us to follow him and to give ourselves holy and committed to his service. And if I may, and simply to conclude my sermon, I would add, a balanced Christian will serve locally, regionally, nationally, or internationally as ordained by God. And likewise, a balanced Christian will sing and play the praises of his Lord at all times, and they will do so with skill, joy, and hope. Let us pray. Lord, let us at all times give you the praise you are undoubtedly due. Help us with your boundless love to raise our praises to you with skill, joy, and hope. Let us, let's, let us serve our neighbors and communities as you would have us do, again with that same skill, joy, and hope. Lord, we thank you that you made each one of us unique so that we could complement each other with our gifts in this fellowship to serve you individually and corporately. Help us always in love to do this with skill, joy, and hope. Amen. If you have any questions about anything